I think the, uh, the main focus of the research has been saying, you know, nature has identified really beautiful and elegant ways to break down a lot of small molecule substrates that constitute greenhouse gases. And where catalysis needs to essentially meet that challenge is to adopt a lot of the functional components that you find in the natural enzymes. Um, it's, it's a departure from classical inorganic chemistry where we're trying to say, you know, these are the structure types that you would find in nature. It's more to saying, how do they work? Can we co-opt that functionality to drive new versions of catalysis? And um, it's, it's a very, very fertile playing ground for a lot of, I think, young chemists. And uh, I'm very excited by what my, my group has been able to do. And we've been able to demonstrate this very simply from a very you know, well-isolated, you know, this is kind of how it works, but then we can extrapolate that into viable catalysis. We can start to do things like pH bond functionalization, which is you know, taking you know, dead plants, dead dinosaurs, and turning them into commodity chemicals like soaps or uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, but then you know, how do you use that game plan on a much larger system such that you can, in a very facile way, break down a lot of the you know, sea of substrates that we have surrounding us and turning them into viable components for chemical industry? Um, so I, I think that's as best as I can summarize what we've been able to do. So uh, the remarkable thing about the way nature works is it's found a really cool way to build an instability to its catalytic centers. Um, inorganic chemistry as a discipline is obsessed with structure and looking at things as static entities. So the really awesome thing about what nature does is saying I, you don't want stability. That's the antithesis of reactivity. And uh, so by using the, the ingredients it has around with it, uh, proteins as the, the housing um, for the catalytic center and the heavy reliance on uh, very ab abundant earth um, transition elements. So first row transition elements like iron, manganese, copper. Um, the combination of those first row elements plus the, the protein superstructure, it makes these things high spin. And that's all that means is that electronically becomes very, very, very reactive. And um, I would say that, you know, we've known about um, this as, a, as a, a design feature, but I don't think it's often been appreciated as saying, yeah, this is critical for making it work. Um, and uh, what we've done is just saying, okay, you know, if this is something that can actually be a useful handle, you know, we know how to make compounds that adapt to these types of electronic configurations. We can make them as unstable as possible, and not surprisingly, it unveils a lot of really, really cool reaction chemistry. So, all right, so biology is hamstrung by keeping an organism alive, right? I don't need to do that. All I need to do is say, I'm going to make something very unstable, put it in the sea of substrate, and just let it do it, do its thing. Um, you, know, you know, for reference, if you look at the water oxidation catalyst in, in photosynthesis, that catalytic center is turning over on the time scale of every 20 minutes. So nature has to repair itself aggressively to be viable for life. When you're trying to think of an abiological context where you don't have to fight thermodynamics and keeping an organism alive, you can just say, let's make this thing at the verge of instability and keep feeding it the things that it's going to want to do. So it's, it's a very simple thing. You know, we're just limiting what it gets exposed to. You know, that being said, if we took our callus and put them out in there, you get a little poof of smoke and then it's dead. You know, but if you're trying to do a very delicate transformation, you know, it works just fine. So you just control its environment. So, so it's, it, they've not been impossible. I mean, a lot of chemical industry is at the foundation of heterogeneous catalysis. But if you think about what makes up a heterogeneous catalyst, it's, you know, this massive array of disorder. You know, there's a lot of different elements in, in very different coordination spaces. But how do you distill out what's the vital component to transferring the reaction that you find attractive? And so what we've done is by making these, you know, um, from the mononuclear to the small clusters, it's saying, okay, let's put it in a, a, you know, poise it to be very reactive and very um, essentially um, unstable. 
in that what that allows us to do is to test hypotheses. Okay, can we drive these multi-electron transformations? So CO2 to methanol is a six-electron process. Uh, nitrogen to ammonia, again, a six-electron process. A single transition element, which is where we spend a lot of our time focusing on, can't do that big of an oxidative swing. That's too hard for one metal to do. And nature doesn't rely on that. If you look at a lot of the cofactors you find in biology, you know, they have a very complex cluster assemblies. They're still molecules, but they have seven or eight metals in that, that reaction space. So what we've said is, okay, you know, let's, let's build something that at least preserves the concept of having multiple metals that can react to the same substrate. And all of a sudden, we started to see you know, four electron chemistry, six electron chemistry, all the way up to 12 electron chemistry. And it's just the, you know, essentially kind of changing what you're, the expectation of the, the molecule is supposed to do. Um, I'd love to say that we've been able to do some of these hoid rail reactions where you can take, you know, uh, you know, CO down to methanol. We can do some of these things in a stoichiometric context, but that's an important first step to say, here's what's possible. Here's a new way of thinking about how to build a catalyst, and, you know, we're just, you know, we're hopefully making the proper steps towards something that would be really, really, I think, really exciting. So one, uh, one thing where we've gotten really nice catalysis is uh, we found with uh, a, a simple, simple molecule that is built to resemble cytochrome P450. That's the active enzyme in your, your liver that basically metabolizes a lot of the, you know, the not-so-great things that we put into our body. It allows you to excrete them as waste by hydroxylating them. Um, so what we've done is said, okay, let's, you know, let's simplify that, that system a little bit more. And then what we found is that it reacts just like the uh, natural enzyme. Um, you know, granted, we're not doing indiscriminate hydroxylation, but we found that this is a good platform for doing C N bond constructions, C O bond constructions, C C bond constructions. And one demonstration of this is we've shown that we can take a very simple aliphatic chain terminated with one functional group. In this case, it's an azide. That's our oxidant. It breaks down the azide and can actually cyclize upon itself. So heterocycles are, are massively important in pharmaceuticals. These build up the backbones of a lot of natural products, a lot of uh, therapeutics. Um, to put that in perspective, uh, uh, I believe I remember reading that you know one out of every six reactions in the chemical industry is to make a carbon nitrogen bond. And you know, and usually what we do for uh, I would say synthesis is you're exchanging functional groups. So you have to pre-activate your substrate, and then um, essentially you displace one reactive component for another. What we're doing is making use of the, the most prevalent functional groups that are there, CH, CH bonds, and allowing that to be something that now you can stitch into very trivially. Um, and so uh, our first report of this to, to make heterocycles, you know, we got a nice paper out of it, but you know, our catalysis was terrible. Right? We were getting a couple of turnovers, and even though we were using iron, you know, it still says you know, this was just a first demonstration. You know, now with maybe another generation of cows, within you know, 12 months, we're gone from 20% mole loading of the catalyst down to, you know, PPM loading the catalyst. So it's, you know, we're really trying to push, you know, just beyond the demonstration of what's possible to say, this is going to be a good tool for chemical synthesis. And so I think that's probably the most clear demonstration of where, you know, we're going to most immediately make an impact. Uh, so a lot of the, the clusters that we've designed are specifically to excise those heteroatoms out of chemical substrates. And, and not only be able to remove that functionality, but then also, you know, essentially excise it now as a very useful product. So um, it's, it's just a, a balance of catalysis. You know, you, you know, you build something to be reactive with everything, and that's what you get. You know, uh, so that's a good thing and a bad thing. And right now, what we're trying to say is, here are its reaction patterns. Here's what we see can happen. But the the cool thing, you know, adapting this notion of building instability uh, from nature, um, we see that even the products that we make are still unstable, such that they can be reacted, or uh, you can use them for further elaboration. You know, the the pitfall of a lot of coordination chemistry is getting into really really deep thermodynamic sinks. 
uh, by choosing to build in these criterion of, in, in, uh, of getting to these very high skin architectures, they're very reactive. So it allows you to continue to break things down in a very suitable manner. And so that's, you know, I, I think, you know, um, if you project out in the future, if we can demonstrate viable catalysis this way, are people going to be using our, our, our exact molecules to put into a free gas? I don't, I don't think so. What it will tell us, though, is here are the design criteria that we can build into um, solid substrate. Here is how you engineer a reaction center such that it does that same thing, and this is something we're also hoping to, to go into. Um, I, like I said, you know, with the, the iron catalysis that we first demonstrated, it was important to, to take kind of a, a very odd um, observation and show that it was viable for catalysis. And so now we're trying to do things that, you know, we can actually make products that people are very, very excited about. Now for the clusters, we've shown here's what's possible in terms of breaking down all these substrates that are classically very, very difficult to do. Um, so how do we turn that into a viable catalyst? And uh, I, I hope, you know, that's, that's where we'll get to in the very near future. Um, but, like I said, it's, it's going to be a combination of that as well as material science engineering where you say, how do we do this now on a, on a solid substrate? How do we do this where you're going to have the robust nature of a, a solid, you know, catalyst surface that you really sacrifice by going to um, a molecule? You know, we were, you know, I think very lucky in terms of saying, we can build in the precise you know, architecture we want on a molecule. How do you transfer that into a solid? How do you make a solid really, really reactive by the same principles? And so that's something we're really excited about getting into. Yeah. 